Hello and welcome to a special discussion hosted by the City of Cupertino. I am Mayor Darcy Paul. Today we are very pleased to present to you a panel discussion on the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. We arrive at this topic due more immediately to a recent event in the Cupertino community. Comments made by our Vice Mayor Liang Chao in a closed email discussion group with other parents of one of our local public school districts were reproduced and publicized without her permission or consultation with her beforehand. They were further characterized both on social media and in the press as being hostile to the notion that the Chinese Exclusion Act was racist legislation, instead focusing upon the purported labor-related aspects of the legislation. Now, in the public sphere, we do deal with a lot of varied issues. My thought on this was to turn this into an opportunity to bring people together for a thoughtful discussion on the topic, rather than to perpetuate an outlet for settling political or interpersonal scores due to issues unrelated to this central question of whether the Chinese Exclusion Act was in fact purely racist, or perhaps whether it was also, or even rather, driven by other factors, such as labor and job-related concerns. And to that end, I think that we have put together and are setting forth a truly interesting and balanced panel. I'm very grateful that Professor Gordon Chang of Stanford University has agreed to be with us here today. Professor Chang is the Senior Associate Vice Provost of Undergraduate Education at Stanford. He is also the Olive H. Palmer Professor in Humanities and has researched, written, and taught extensively on issues related to and concerning our topic today. Connie Young Yu, a renowned author who has written extensively on Asian American issues, is part of our panel, as well as Edward Taporn, Executive Director of the Angel Island Immigration Station Foundation. Mina Xu, our community member from Cupertino, will be moderating a panel comprised of the panelists mentioned previously. Mina is an engineer, mother, American immigrant, originally from China, and vice chair of our Cupertino Parks and Recreation Commission. I appreciate our community's interest in this topic, and I ask that we keep in mind our common effort to keep creating this righteous tapestry of democracy that we all have such a privilege to work on and improve. To that end, let's keep our discussion of a high quality and friendly. In the end, after all, we are all doing this to help each other. Oh, hello, everyone. And thank you for coming to this educational panel. Uh, and my name is Mina Xu. Uh, I'll be the moderator today. And it's my first time to moderate such a panel. <laughs> if I forgot anything, please remind me. <laughs> and, and I think the video is really good. When I'm watching it, my heart just cannot help thinking. And thanks for Mayor Paul to organizing this panel, because I believe more people should learn what happened in the past in the US. And today, we have three very excellent panelists. And I believe they can teach us a lot. Uh, and the first one is Professor Gordon Chang. He's a famous professor in Stanford University. And he studied several different areas in history, including the historical connections between race and ethnicity in the American and the foreign relations. He has written and continued to publish in many areas of US diplomacy, America-China relationship, Asian American history, and global history. And there are several books examining the history of Chinese railroad workers in the America in the 19th century. And Professor Chang, can you give your open remark? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Is this all on? And uh, well, thank you for the invitation to speak today. I'm just going to have some overview comments. And I, we, this is a panel discussion. And we have a good crowd here. We can have a, a good conversation. I enjoy conversations rather than just lecturing. So, so let me um, 
Um, uh, interesting, uh, good, good, good uh, 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 information here on the board. Um, one, I'm going to offer some uh, context for the 1882 Act. Uh, l let me just uh, make a couple of clarifications. The 1882 Act was originally called the Chinese Restriction Act. It was not called the Chinese Exclusion Act. It was a Restriction Act because it was limited to a certain class of people, as we talked about or has been talked about. It was aimed at Chinese laborers initially, and it was not indefinite. It was passed for 10 years. It was called an Restriction Act. Afterwards, when it was renewed periodically, 10 years, 10 years, and then indefinitely, it became known, and as we know it today, as the Chinese Exclusion Act. Uh, but uh, the basic outlines of that act uh, were in place in 1882. That's one point. <clears throat> the second was that the act was, uh, efforts to, 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 to uh, pass the act went on for years before 1882. It was, in some ways, the con uh, a culmination of, so of years of anti-Chinese agitation in the United States and California, as the video showed, but across the country. So it is it's not just a blip, but it was a, a crest of uh, much political activity. Uh, the chi so-called Chinese question was a national question uh, of, of great, uh, atten given great attention in the, 18, the late 1870s and early 1880s. Um, the, set, the third point uh, is that the video was a little unclear about is that there were two main provisions of the act. One was this restriction of Chinese laborers for 10 years, prohibiting further immigration of Chinese laborers. That, that was sort of a compromise uh, among the proponents and opponents of the bill, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. There were many people who, at the time, whites who opposed the bill um, and for, because they said it was racist. I mean, even at the time, there were many who uh, understood the uh, racial intent of the bill. The other dimension of it, which is very, very important, uh, and I think in some ways more important, was that it confirmed the ineligibility of Chinese to become U.S. citizens. They were deemed aliens ineligible for citizenship. And to me, that had more implication than the restriction um, for various reasons. And anyway, those provisions stayed in place roughly until 1943. So Chinese Either Chinese immigrants could not become naturalized citizens in the United States until 1943. It's a long 60 years. Uh, and, and that clearly had a racial intent. Now, here's, here's some other context. Uh, the, the video was correct in pointing out that it was the first uh, immigration act that specifically named a group of people, ethnic group of people to, uh, uh, to exclude from the United States. Uh, what the video uh, could, could have done was to place this act in the long continuum of American Immigration Act uh, and its racial intent and consequence. And I would suggest to you, I would argue, that American immigration policy from the very beginning has had a racial intent and consequence. Even today, America's immigration laws and enforcement are highly racial. They're not just happen to be what they are, and people said this or that. It is clear intent on uh, the immigration laws in order to shape and influence the racial composition of the United States. Now, I'll get, here's some evidence to, to support that. The first major act that affected immigration to the United States was passed in 1790. 1790, which is called the Naturalization Act or the, or the uh, nat uh, uh, Nationality Act. It goes by different names, popular names. Now that act in 1790 stipulated, uh, soon after the passage uh, ratification of the Constitution, of who could become a citizen of the United States. That's why it's called the Naturalization Act. And it said the main key provision was any free white person could become a citizen of the United States through naturalization. This is not, this is aside from those who are native born. So the naturalization, I think that the people who come from another country come here and obtain US citizenship. That's naturalization. Any free white person. Now that's clearly a racial element. Uh, we also know that African Americans by far were already enslaved in the United States. They were by, in the Constitution, not citizens of the United States. They could not become citizens of the United States. 
Native Americans were considered not citizens of the United States, but of members of alien nations. Um, and so free white person, even though Chinese had started to come to the United States beginning in the 1850s, as my ancestors did, they could not become citizens of the United States already uh, from their arrival in the United States. So the 1882 Act confirmed uh, that element by specifically naming Chinese, although it is confirmed by the 1790 uh, Naturalization Act. The second major act that's relevant to talk about here is the 1870, 1870 Naturalization or, or uh, uh, Naturalization or Nationality Act. This was passed soon after the Civil War in the wake of the passage of many uh, uh, amendments to the Constitution which aimed to give uh, full citizenship to free people, to African Americans. Parenthetically, I'm really great that we're having this conversation. I'm a historian, I love history. I wish more people would love history because we, don't, we can't understand where we are today unless you know history. And that goes for all Americans also, but especially newcomers who don't know the history of this country and what the legacies and inheritances and the shape of the country is from our history. So uh, I'm a, it's a booster of studying history. So I'm giving you sort of history lessons today. These are very, very important. So in the 1870 Act, uh, there was a heated discussion about this. And you can go back and look at the uh, congressional record and other committee records about passing this. And it came up, well, who, this was an important issue because the Civil War resulted in the freeing, the ending of slavery in the United States. The, the amendments to the Constitution, several of them, sought to make sure that free people were understood to be citizens of the United States, full citizens of the United States. But there were various ambiguities. And one ambiguity was, what about those free people who had been born in Africa and were enslaved in the United States? Could they be citizens of the United States? And the 1870 Act, uh, and there were people in the South who wanted to deny them citizenship, but the 1870 Act clearly stated and, and revised the 1790 Act to state any free white person and person of African nativity could become citizens of the United States. So it clearly, that was the intent of that legislation. Now, in the discussion of that act, people raised, including, very importantly, Frederick Douglass, the leading, one of the leading black Af abolitionists, said, let's do away with all racial categories in the naturalization. Anybody, anybody, whatever color, can become a citizen of the United States, black or whatever. And people uh, explicitly raised, well, we do that, then the Chinese are going to become citizens. And we don't want that. They're, it's going to be terrible. And so there was a great deal to do about this. And unfortunately, the passage of the act included those that passage, free white persons and persons of African nativity, and consciously excluded uh, the Chinese. So even before the 1882 act, the Chinese were marginalized in a fundamental way in the United States. Now, a, more, a little more legislative history. And this makes it part of a local history. In 1868, 1868, I know these are all distant dates, there was a man named Anson Burlingame. If you know the name Burlingame, I hope you do. It's just up the, up the road here. Burlingame, the town, which is named after him. Now, who was Anson Burlingame? Anson Burlingame had been appointed by Abraham Lincoln to be the U.S. Mission, uh, emissary to China. And Anson Burlingame was, uh, uh, had been a congressman from Massachusetts, and he was very keen on his task of representing the United States to the empire of China. And later on, because of his friendly uh, attitude, the Chinese government uh, hired him to represent China to the United States and to European countries. A very important person. And during his time in service, he uh, encouraged the passage of a very important treaty that became known as the Anson Treaty for him, a Burlingame Treaty, Burlingame Treaty 1868, which basically said that the two countries, China and the United States, were equal. They could do equal access to each other's countries. Americans could go to China, do business, to uh, uh, conduct religious uh, activities uh, and so forth. And, and likewise, the Chinese could do the same. So it was a 
treaty of equality and reciprocity. Now, that's important to recognize because, as I mentioned, it took years for the passage of the 1882 Act to be passed. Why? Because there were many people who said, you can't pass this racist bill against the Chinese because we have the Burlingame Treaty, which accorded equality to the two countries and the people of both countries. And you can't pass an act that supersedes diplomatic treaty. The treaties are above congressional acts. And so they had to find a way, the proponents of the 18 of exclusion, ways around the Burlingame Treaty, which they finally did in 1880 or around that time. Still, Congress couldn't pass the act because so many people opposed the act because they said it was discriminatory, both on moral grounds. They said, we just came through this, you know, we came from recent memory of the terrible civil war about race and division and all that. And also, they said, the Chinese were so valuable to the country because they helped build the railroad. And that's something which I study and hope that you will know more about in your own, your own meetings. So the passage that this act came up was passed by Congress through small margins a couple of times and vetoed by the presidents of the United States a couple of times because they said, we need the Chinese here for labor to help, because they help build a railroad. Uh, and we do this, it's bad for, it's not in our own self-interest and it also violates treaties. So the, the Immigration Act of 1882, it sits in a broader context one of racialized immigration laws that had intent and consequence of race. And we can talk about today's immigration laws, which I think continue to do that. But that's clearly the, the situation in the 1880s and up through uh, the subsequent uh, decades. Um, now, let me just add, uh, there were also other efforts before 1882 to try to pass laws to uh, restrict or, or, or limit the number of Chinese coming in the country, and this, these might be discussed uh, by other panelists in a moment. But I'll just add, end with uh, a, a discussion of another important case. Now, we've all we've been reading the news about the Supreme Court these, these past a couple of weeks. Uh, there is what's fascinating to me and to us as all Americans, we should know, and, and there's this reference in the video, is the Chinese tried to fight for their rights, for equal rights from the very beginning. And one of the most important cases that was raised by a Chinese American was by a Chinese American, born in San Francisco, whose name was Wong Kim Ark. Wong Kim Ark. He'd been born in the United States and therefore was an American citizen by birthright. The 14th Amendment to the Constitution says all persons uh, uh, in, born in the United States are citizens of the United States. It's birthright citizenship, not naturalized citizenship. He'd been born in the United States. He'd gone to China as a young man to visit relatives to do business, and he, he took out the records and papers, identified him, and so forth. And then he left, and he came back, no problem. He did another trip. On this way, on the second trip, or third trip when he came back, the immigration officer, some, some, some guy at the gate, said, you can't come in. Stop. You can, we're not entering. Not. Because the way I read that law, that immigration officer said, is that you're excluded from the United States because you are a Chinese by blood. By blood. The citizenship issue, 14th Amendment, didn't matter. The Chinese Exclusion Act said you can't come into the country. I'm preventing you from coming in the country. Eventually, he, took, he, he litigated that. And took it all the way to the Supreme Court in a very famous case, Wong Kim Ark versus the United States. And the Wong Kim Ark case, the Supreme Court, uh, in its wisdom then, uh, ruled in favor of Wong Kim Ark and used uh, as part of the rationale the 14th Amendment that birthright citizenship applied to all persons born in the United States. That's such a key issue because that has now come up in recent years to try to deny birthright citizenship to all sorts of classes of people in the United States. And the defenders of birthright citizenship from all sorts of communities and all sorts of peoples of uh, different races refer to Wong Kim Ark and the 14th Amendment in his case 
as affirming this valuable issue of birthright citizenship. So the 1882 Act is really important to understand in and of itself, as well as in the broader context of what it means for American immigration, for American citizenship, and for who we are as Americans today. This is so important in my mind because so much of the anti-Asian violence we've seen in recent years is based on, you know, you know these slurs, go back to where you came from, you know, we're not wanted here, in the sense that Chinese and other Asians have not been part of the United States, are not part of the United States. But if you know some of this history, I think you have, people would have a better sense of the integral role and the, and the, and the, and the deep uh, the place of Chinese and other Asians in the country, and hopefully that would uh, counter some of this uh, hostility against Asian Americans today. So history is very, very relevant to the present. Thank you. Hey. Thank you. Hey. Thank you, Professor Chang. It's very illuminating. And as a first generation new immigrant, I didn't have a chance to learn so many things about the, uh, yeah, the Chinese Exclusion Act and the background information. Um, thank you for this. Um, our next panelist is Connie Yang Yu, and she is a famous writer and lecturer and activist in the US, and she uh, writes several books. One is uh, Chinatown, San Jose, USA, and the other is uh, Profiles in Excellence, Peninsula Chinese Americans. And she is also the co-editor of Voice from the Railroad Stories by Descendants of Chinese Railroad Workers. And as an activist, and she has uh, devoted her energy for half century in rediscovering a history of Chinese Asian American that has been forgotten, overlooked, and even hidden. And I also heard you have some uh, first-hand family history about this topic. I really would like to listen to that. Oh, thank you very much, Mina, for the introduction. And I um, want to say I'm very grateful to Professor Gordon Chang, my friend from over 50 years. Um, he knows that my work has always been based on oral history, the stories that my ancestors um, passed down to me, you know, I'm third generation on my father's side, fourth generation uh, on my mother's. And um, let's see, in 2012, Gordon Chang invited me to his office, you know, to talk about the new project uh, of Stanford's new project, Stanford's Chinese Railroad Workers Project in North, in North America project, and um, said, you know, we're doing all kinds of studies from archaeology to archival research, and I'd like you to conduct oral history interviews of descendants of Chinese railroad workers. And I just thought, well, you know, going back, do you think any descendants would have anything to say about uh, Chinese railroad work, their ancestors who worked, you know, in, from 1865 to 1869 on the Transcontinental Railroad? He said, you may not find much, but you will find something that you, you have to, you know, this is so, such a, uh, so worth trying. So we did not find out, you know, a, Gary, a Barry Fong was a videographer and uh, videotaped the interviews and I did, um, you know, the questions and answers and had wonderful discussions with fellow descendants. Uh, we didn't find out how the Chinese, they built the tunnels or, or how they built 10 miles of track in one day. But what we did find was an incredible arc of the story of the era of Chinese pioneers through the era of exclusion, through World War II, through the, uh, the struggles of the, uh, the 50s and 60s. Yes, there were struggles. And to this day of anti-Asian hate. So it was very gratifying. The stories resonated with me because I knew about you know, what it was like be being uh, chased out of a Chinatown, being driven out because of the stories of my grandfather. Uh, and the, here's the slide. You can see his photograph. 
And this is a certificate of residence by order of the Geary Act, which extended the Chinese Exclusion Act for another 10 years. And you notice that it's dated, well, if you could see, it's dated 1894. And all the certificates were dated not 1892, but 1894, because the Chinese resisted this horrific act, which would require every Chinese every Chinese, regardless of class, to register and have a photo ID. And if caught without that, the person could be arrested, possibly deported, and also threatened with one year of hard labor, cruel and unusual punishment. So um, this, he was in San Francisco at the time because on May 4th, 1887, when he was working in the strawberry fields, um, see, Santa Clara Valley was developed by Chinese labor. Uh, and my grandfather was one of the, the later ones we're talking. He came in 1881, one year before the exclusion law, at the age of 11. In all my family, you know, all our family reunions and discussions, we've always said, you're so lucky Grandpa came when he was 11 years old. If he waited till he was 12, we wouldn't be here. So I've always lived with that, that kind of like, oh, lucky me. You know, he came before the Chinese exclusion law. So I've always known about the struggle and what it meant, and also what happened to our relatives who tried to come in afterwards and their detention on Angel Island. Anyway, I just want to go back to the, uh, to, Market Street, Chinatown, eight, May 4th, 1887. It was set by arson fire, and it was not an official act, but the, the racism was institutionalized by the Chinese exclusion law and many, many ordinances from the city and county that were uh, persecuting the Chinese. So it was institutionalized terrorism. And I could say that because when my grandfather, when he would leave, as a young boy, when he would leave the Chinatown, he would have to run really fast because rocks could be thrown at him and nobody would stop them, stop the, the people throwing rocks at him. And he'd run, have, have to run back really fast, you know, back to the, the safety of home base, which was Market Street Chinatown. And it was the third la largest Chinatown at the time that it was burned. And, um, it was a home base for thousands of workers because it takes, it takes a lot of people to support a Chinatown that large. And so the, the city already had condemned the Chinatown. The Chinese were, were supposed to be evicted. But before that happened, the arson fire. And so um, the Chinese were left homeless. But within 10 days of the fire, the Chinese merchants were already meeting you know, to, to try to, to stay. They wanted to stay. There was resistance, and this is important. Um, they signed an agreement with John Heinlein, who owned uh, some pat pasture land, which is now Japantown. And it was a struggle for him, you know, facing, you know, the, he was denied ordinance, he was denied uh, permits to build, and the Chinese were um, uh, harassed, and there was a big protective organization, you know, uh, formed. And these people who, who objected to the Chinese and formed the Citizens Protective Organization, they felt they were being patriotic because this is an official uh, uh, policy to exclude Chinese, to prevent a Chinatown. And I, I just want to mention that Market Street Chinatown, perhaps the residents were more fortunate than places like in Tacoma and uh, Rock Springs, where Chinese were shot and beaten and uh, driven out of town, but there were casualties. But the, the Chinese themselves, they, 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 during the fire, there were casualties. They were burned trying to save their things, while people, the citizens around the town, stood and watched and laughed. So this is what I have uh, inherited from my grandfather, whom I knew as a wonderful, gentle, non-better person, unlike myself, you know, <laughs> and um, told me these stories and also why he wanted to come back to San Jose. But before he came back to San Jose, he worked in San Francisco, which was, 
I guess Daifo, big city, was the one safety place that people could go to. And it also was threatened like during the earthquake. But, um, but anyway, I wanted to show you his uh, certificate of residence, which my, my mother took out to show me when I was writing my first article called uh, Chinese and American Courts in 1972. And it was about you know how the Chinese went to court to fight the exclusion laws and ordinances. And some battles won, many lost. But my mother said, oh, you want to see this document I've kept in my trunk all these years, as if she's afraid that we'd be kicked out if he didn't have it. So um, this is Wong Wa Gok. And that was his name before he got married, Yong Song Guang later. And then I want to show you certificates of a, of a family. A friend of mine, um, Janice Tong in San Francisco said, you know, I've been keeping these documents and nobody's ever seen them, but I've been keeping them for safekeeping. I know they're important. And, um, and I asked if, for permission to show them. This is her great grandmother. And uh, she's 25 years old. And you see, it's, she's a, she um, is a mother and uh, she works in, in a sewing factory, and she's, it's listed as laborer there. And here's her husband, and also listed as laborer, and it says that he is sewing in a factory in San Francisco, and um, he's 35 years old. And here is Janice's grandfather, the, the couple's child, and he, you see the stamp, it says person other than laborer. And he's listed his occupation, it looks like student. He's eight years old. And I think he was probably seven because the Chinese always added another year. You know, they counted, uh, you know, the nine months as a year. So I, I think it's important that we have faces and names to the people who, who endured all these things. And, and um, here they are. And uh, that's the documentation I have. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, thank you for sharing your, uh, so many family stories. And I'm very sorry to hear your ancestors suffered from the unjust laws. And I'm very sorry to hear your grandmother stuck on Andrew Island for several months. Yeah. And oh, 15 I'm, months, over 15 months, yeah. Wow, that's a long yeah, time. That's on my mother's side, the, the daughter-in-law of the railroad worker when she was coming back from China. Oh. So, so yeah. um, our next panelist is Edward Tapon. He's the executive director of the Andrew Island Immigration Station Foundation. And this foundation in, put in effort to preserve and restore the historic immigration station and, and Andrew Island. From 1910 to 1940, Andrew Island was used to enforce the nation's exclusionary immigration policies. And it served as a interrogation, detention, and uh, quarantine site. Uh, and Ed, I just think yeah, you can introduce more about this. Okay. Thank you, Mina. Thank you, Mayor Paul, for hosting this. And Professor Chang and Connie, it is an honor to be on this stage with okay. you. Before I begin remarks, I wanted to ask a question of the people who are watching this live in, in the room. Can you please raise your hand if you learned about Angel Island in school? So in a room full of 20, 30 people, it's interesting to note that only one person raised their hand. And for me, I'm an immigrant myself. I was born in Bangkok, Thailand, and immigrated to the US in the 1970s. I grew up in Houston, Texas, and definitely did not learn about Angel Island in school there. When I finally did learn about Angel Island, I was appalled on two levels. First, that this happened, that over 500,000 people were interrogated, processed, and detained at Angel Island because of their race, because most of them were Asian Pacific Islanders. I was also appalled on a second level that I had never learned about this in school. 
And that really is why the Angel Island Immigration Station Foundation exists, is to ensure that the site remains standing so that we can all continue to learn about this history where it happened and to continue to spark dialogue and raise awareness about the history of immigration to the US and ensure that when we think about immigration, we think not just about the Statue of Liberty in Ellis Island, but we also remember Angel Island. Now, Angel Island has sometimes been called the Ellis Island of the West, but whereas the Statue of Liberty and Ellis Island are a reminder of our country's welcome of immigrants over the years, Angel Island reminds us of a darker chapter, one of exclusion and detention. And over the next couple of slides, I just wanna share a little bit with you about this history of Angel Island that, again, many of us have not learned, in class at least. So following up on Professor Chang's remarks, it's important to note that there were decades of exclusionary immigration laws that targeted Asians and Pacific Islanders. So as he noted, the Chinese Exclusion Act, although it was one of the first, it was definitely not the last. And you see represented by these other bullet points, a whole litany of other immigration policies and laws that were passed in the decades uh, following the Exclusion Act of 1882 that essentially created an Asian Pacific barred zone where anyone from an Asian Pacific Islander country would not be able to become a US citizen. I wanna take a moment to, to really reflect on, on the images that you see on, on the screen and to distinguish what the process looked like for immigrants who came through Angel Island versus those who came through Ellis Island. So Ellis Island was really meant as a processing center, as an open door. Most European immigrants who came through Ellis Island spent only a matter of hours in, in processing on Ellis Island before being allowed to enter the US. It was a very different process for, for immigrants who came to Angel Island, both Asian as well as non-Asian. So remember, we're back in the 1910s to 1940s. In the early years of the immigration station, those who traveled from China would be on board a steamboat that took about three weeks to, to make the journey across the Pacific Ocean. Once that steamboat arrived in San Francisco Bay, they were greeted by immigration officials. And those immigration officials would go into the cabins of the first class passengers in the privacy of their own cabins, they would have a very cursory registration and perhaps a, a very cursory medical screening. And if you weren't one of the excluded classes, because there were different exceptions for the Chinese Exclusion Act, if you were a merchant or a politician or a business owner, that, that was an exception where you possibly could be allowed to enter the US. But if you didn't fit one of those classes or they suspected that you were not who you said you were, in most cases, Asians and Pacific Islanders were then put onto a separate ferry to Angel Island. Included in the list of passengers who were ferried to Angel Island was anyone who was deemed to be likely to become a public charge or someone who would be dependent on government support for viability and sustainability. And in many cases, women experienced that categorization because back then, unless, if you were especially a woman traveling by yourself and not with a husband or family, uh, there were concerns that you might be a person of ill repute or essentially a prostitute. And then there was also people who might have one of the list of excludable medical conditions. And that would also be a reason for someone to be put on this ferry to go to Angel Island. Once people landed at Angel Island, they were segregated on three different levels. Asians were segregated from other non-Asians. Chinese were segregated from other Asians and men and women were segregated from each other. Now, remember when I said that the experience on Ellis Island only lasted at a few hours. At Angel Island, it could last anywhere from three days to three weeks, 15 months, all the way up to two years is the longest period of detention on Angel Island. I wanna start with the image that you see on the left-hand side of the screen. So what that image represents is a historical image uh, depicting the medical screenings that, that immigrants undertook at, LF, at Angel Island. What we know from historical accounts is that if you were a European immigrant coming through Angel Island, it also was a very cursory medical screening. Whereas if you were an Asian immigrant, you were forced to strip completely naked and to provide blood and stool samples, all in the efforts for the medical officials to see if you had one of these excludable medical conditions, things like liver flukes, 
tuberculosis, uh, other diseases, where if you had anything in that list, then you would be forced to go to the hospital on Angel Island, pay for your own treatment. And if you didn't get better, or if you couldn't afford that treatment, that would be grounds for deportation. I do want to note that in, in this particular photo, we believe it's a staged photo because the, the men are only half undressed. But again, from historical accounts, they, the immigrants there were forced to, to fully undress. And for Chinese in particular, this was even more humiliating because the medical practices at the time in China, you didn't have, you, you remained fully clothed when you visited an herbalist or a medical practitioner in China. So this was very foreign to the Chinese and other Asian immigrants. In the middle of the screen, you see a, a, a historical photo of women. And if you look closely, there is actually a little baby. Uh, and, and so what this picture represents is that both men, women, and children were historically detained on Angel Island. Again, for European immigrants, that length of detention typically was only a couple of days, perhaps a week at the longest. Whereas for Chinese immigrants, it often stretched into months. And part of the reason for that is as uh, what you see on the right hand side, the process also included what was called a board of special inquiry. In other words, it was truly an interrogation that could last for hours, days, and on to weeks and months. What they would happen during these boards of special inquiry is that the immigration officials would ask question upon question, hundreds of questions of these immigrants trying to verify their identity. And there are questions that even for those who were authentically traveling, who had a legal right to be entering the US, uh, would be difficult to answer. Questions such as, what direction does the window in your bedroom face? How many steps are in your home? What's the name of the neighbor who lives three doors down from you? And so these questions would be answered by the immigrants and then matched with the person that they claimed was their, their relative. Oftentimes, for the Chinese immigrants undergoing this detention, this detention and interrogation, 60% of them actually failed this initial interrogation. But fortunately for them, there was an appeals process. And that's why the Chinese detention often lasted longer, is that it took several months for the appeals process to work its way through the legal system. Eventually, after most uh, of, of the, the processes and appeals, what did happen is that the majority of Chinese immigrants at Angel Island were able to, to make it through. Uh, but again, a comparison, comparing to Ellis Island, uh, only 3% of immigrants who came through Ellis Island were refused entry, whereas at Angel Island, that number is 18%. So this just gives you a little bit of, of more history and data about how different the experience was between Angel Island and Ellis Island, and how different the experience was for Asian immigrants at Angel Island compared to European immigrants. What's also important to note, as you see on the screen, is that there was a broader history of immigrants who came through Angel Island. Every single country and region that you see on the screen represents someone who came through Angel Island. So nearly 80 different countries are represented on this list. And just very quickly, uh, there are a few people whose names might be more familiar to all of us. Uh, on the left-hand side, I am Pei, spent a, a few days on Angel Island. In the middle of the screen, Tyra Swang, who is renowned for being a Disney am animator and painted many of the beautiful backdrops that all of us who saw Bambi uh, grew up with. And then on the right-hand side of the screen, the Begay family. They were detained on Angel Island. And I think their story is also indicative of what many people who came through Angel Island experienced after they left Angel Island. So after their detention, they were allowed entry into the US, and they tried to settle into Berkeley, California. Uh, they'd bought a house, but their neighbors actually barricaded the door and prohibited them from moving in. So let me just end with this slide. Uh, there's definitely much more history to, to uncover about Angel Island than I can squeeze into a, a brief presentation. But I did want to invite all of you to come out and visit Angel Island. The site is now a National Historic Landmark. There were initially plans to, to demolish all the buildings and make way for campsites and picnic tables. But thanks to the organizing and leadership of Connie and her colleagues, 
who were some of the initial leaders of the Angel Island Immigration Station Historical Advisory Committee, we now have this beautiful historic place that is both a California historic landmark as well as a national historic landmark. And for those of you who make the trek out to Angel Island, we in one month's time will have two buildings that are open to the public that represent not only the history of immigration through Angel Island, but also immigration today. On the left-hand side is the Detention Barracks Museum. And in this museum, you'll find over 200 poems that were carved by the Chinese detainees that really lift up the themes and elements of their detention and their experience. And it's these poems that allowed us to, to save the site. You'll also see recreations of the cramped conditions that immigrants were, were detained in. And on the right-hand side is the Angel Island Immigration Museum. This building has never been open to the general public before, and we're very excited to announce the opening of the museum on January 22nd, 2022. And in this museum, you will see a number of different permanent exhibits that highlight the history of not just exclusion and detention, but also lift up and celebrate the contributions of immigrants, both those who came through Angel Island as well as those who've come more recently. And so I started my remarks with a question. I'll end with a question. Uh, can you please raise your hand if you've ever visited the Angel Island Immigration Station? So it's great to see that there are a few more hands raised here, and I hope that within one year's time that every hand would be raised. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Edward, and thanks, Professor Chang, Connie, and Ed. Uh, we really learned a lot today, and what you shared is really important, and we should remember the history because history is always a mirror to the future. Yeah, that will will keep that in mind. And thank you for the suggestion for our generation. Yes, we should stand up, speed out, and be more involved in our community. And we should uh, ask our friends to vote to make our voice louder. And, and now I just. Uh, ask Mayor Paul to come back for the concluding remark. Thank you. Thanks, Mina. And um, I, I do want to thank all of our uh, audience members for being here today. Um, Justin, I, I did want to mention that our president of the Cupertino Historical Society is actually sitting right behind you. and. Uh, so before I give my kind of formal uh, closing remarks, I also wanted to mention, uh, Connie, with regard to your uh, comment about the mayor of Saratoga talking about uh, door slam in her face, uh, the other comment that she had made was that one of the neighbors actually said, if you want to run for city council, then you should go to Cupertino. <laughs> because, of course, looking at the uh, demographic of our city council, so it, it's, it's just fascinating. Well, thank you, Mina. And thank you everyone for helping us to have this valuable discussion today. I would like in this brief closing also to thank a couple of people who helped make our program happen. First, thanks to Buck G for making some key introductions for our very excellent panelists here today. Thanks so very much to our entire panel, to our moderator, Mina Shu, to Professor Gordon Chang, to Connie Young Yu, and to Ed Tephorn. And can we have a big round of applause for the entire panel? Oh, thank you. Additionally, Dr. Michael Chang was who initially reached out to me to put this event uh, together. And I want to add that subsequent to that, I did reach out to our vice mayor who fully supported the idea of having our panel today. After that, once I found that our entire city council wished to be here to support the idea of Cupertino standing united against discrimination, I realized after consulting with our city attorney, in order to do that, we would have to notice the special meeting that we have here uh, right now today. And this is, uh, the, as was pointed out, just the first step in uh, Cupertino producing content, which we uh, expect to produce and release in January 2022. And I want to help uh, produce that, of course, but I want to thank our city staff for helping to put this together for us. And on behalf of our city council, my closing message to all of us is that I hope that we can all strive to understand and uh, that we all have our facets and complexities, but we still have to do our best to be good friends. 
to try to understand each other, to share common values, and to work together to keep forming that more perfect union. Thanks again, and we'll keep this good conversation going. Take care, everyone. Thank you.